Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name's Imani Rupert Gordon. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the executive director for the National Center for Lesbian Rights. We're a legal organization, and we work to achieve civil and human rights for all LGBTQ people and our families. This is a wonderful time of year um, because next year in 2022, NCLR will be celebrating 45 years of service. It's 45 years of serving the most underrepresented folks in the movement and 45 years of us leading by example. And NCLR leads differently than others in the movement. Though we're just a fraction of the size of some other national LGBTQ organizations, our footprint is enormous. Our family law program built the infrastructure that supports families that were at one time considered non-traditional, but you know that we see our work in in every in the infrastructure that now supports all families. We're the first national LGBTQ organization to start an LGBTQ sports program and the policy that the NCAA uses today to support trans athletes was developed at NCLR, ensuring that everyone can play sports. And NCLR was the first national organization to have, have an LGBTQ specific immigration and asylum program. And to this day, every single one of our clients have won their asylum case. And we are also the first national organization to work on banning conversion therapy. And we continue to lead that work through our Born Perfect campaign. And following our lead, the largest organizations in the movement are also working on conversion therapy, making the reach that much stronger. And our programs like Rural Pride and our work with the LGBTQ Anti-Poverty Network and Uncommon Ground continue to prioritize the communities within the LGBTQ community that experiences the highest level of discrimination so that we're helped create in a world where everyone is supported. So today, I am excited to welcome you to our final installment of NCLR's conversation series, where we take a deep dive into some of our work. We know that all the work that we do is important, and we know that you know that, but sometimes we don't always understand all of the reasons why it's important and why it matters to all of us. We want you to see how this work supports real life people and real life cases from people that experience it and work on this with us. Today, we're gonna to be talking about families. We know that there are so many beautiful and amazing and common sense ways that we create our families. And so too, it's important that we have laws that support all of us and all of our families. That's a matter of equity and it's a matter of dignity. Today, talking to us about this will be NCLR's own Kathy Sakamura, the Deputy Director and Family Law Director here at NCLR, and she will be moderating the conversation. We'll also be joined by Shannon Minter, NCLR's Legal Director, and Ming Wong, Supervising Helpline Attorney at NCLR. And our guest today is Mark Solomon, a longtime LGBTQ activist and author. Though I'm sure many of you know him from his masterful political strategy and helping us to achieve national marriage equality. But today we're going to be talking about his pivotal role in helping to pass landmark family law legislation in New York. We're going to get ready and kick things off. Kathy, why don't you go ahead and get us started. Thank you so much, Imani, and good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Sakimura, Deputy Director and Family Law Director, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm so delighted to be joined here with Shannon, by Shannon, Mark, and Ming to talk a little bit about our work, um, which really has spanned the decades because we have worked on family law throughout NCLR's history and really able to, to cover so many areas of family law and so many aspects of our communities and all of the ways that uh, the, the families in our communities uh, have children and form families. First, I wanna invite Shannon Minter, our amazing legal director who has been leading NCLR's legal team and work for, as you probably know, over 25 years, uh, as well as his 11 pets who may make a bit of an appearance here to talk to us a little bit about the history of LGBT family law work uh, over the decades and how it has progressed. Thank you so much, Kathy. It's so great to be on here with Kathy and Ming. I'm so lucky to work with them. And it's really cool to be here with you, Mark. You're just like one of my long-term uh, heroes. Uh, yeah, so I was just gonna say a teeny little bit about uh, you know the history 
of family law. I mean, it's kind of like the quintessential LGBTQ issue because it's like personal, it's political, it's like so important. I mean, what what matters more to people than your relationships with your children, your your partner or partners, your family, however you define family. I mean, it's just so central to our lives. And it's one of the places where anti-LGBTQ stereotypes and bias and just venomous lies about who we are have been so painful and had such a horrible impact on so many of our of our lives and our families. So there's that. And then, I mean, I was just thinking like, it's also, it's so typical of, I mean, what's happening in family law now is kind of like what's happening with across the board with all of our issues, which is you think on the one hand, we just made like this, like honestly, like completely astonishing progress. And at the same time, there are still areas of such severe harm and discrimination, but they're harder to see than they used to be for, for many of us. Um, so it's just interesting to think about in that way. And so, you know, just real quick, I mean, there was a time not that long ago when if you were an openly lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender person in a child custody dispute, you were going to lose custody of your kids, Forget period. There was a time not that long ago when there was no such thing as second parent adoptions. There was no way for, for same-sex couples who were uh, planning families together to get protection for those families. I, and when I think about, and Mark, this one will, I know is like, you know, gonna gonna resonate with you. I, it I, it always blows my mind to think it was two thousand and one before the first state in the country. It happened to be California had any form of of statewide recognition for same sex relationships. That was California it was domestic partnership, and it didn't give you anything but hospital visitation rights. But fourteen years later, we've got nationwide marriage equality. I mean, that's amazing. You now can do second parent adoptions everywhere. Sexual orientation is no longer a factor in child custody disputes in any state, except maybe sometimes in Alabama. But, um, you know, I mean, that is like incredible, remarkable progress. And at the same time, there are still these pockets, <laughs> really sorry, layers of just severe discrimination. <laughs> including especially for transgender parents who still do lose custody of their kids just for being transgender. That is a very real problem. And then the other, there's others, but the other big one I want to flag is just the, the severe pervasive discrimination against families in the child welfare system. If you're poor, if you're especially a poor LGBTQ parent of color, uh, you are living in jeopardy of losing your kids for no good reason whatsoever. And there's recent research actually that shows that black lesbian mothers are extremely likely, one of the, the groups are most likely to have their children wrongfully taken away from them by the state. So we still got some serious work to do. But anyhow, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, and now I'm just so pleased to be joined by Mark Solomon and one of his beautiful babies. Um, and Mark is a nationally recognized political strategist who is, of course, as Imani said, one of the key architects of the marriage equality movement uh, through his work with Freedom to Marry and Mass Equality. Um, Mark worked as the political strategist for the Child Parent Security Act in New York on behalf of the coalition that worked to pass this bill. Um, and I had the great fortune of working very closely with Mark in this process and benefiting from his incredible expertise. And we wanted to highlight this bill, um, which went into effect earlier this year, because it covers a lot of the different areas that impact LGBTQ families. It covers surrogacy you know, legalizing surrogacy where it had been illegal before and doing so in an ethical way that respects and protects the rights of people involved in the surrogacy process. It broadly protects families using all forms of assisted reproduction, and it provides protection specifically for low-income people to be able to access free, easily accessible processes for protecting their relationships. And so I think has just a breadth of different ways in which it protects families and serves as a wonderful model for other states. So thank you so much, Mark, for joining us so late and for bringing one of your beautiful babies and talking to us about this work. Sure. This is Susanna Barrett Solomon. She just turned six months old. And uh, so um, as Shannon was saying, the, uh, the political is the personal and uh, never more than in a 
than in this uh, area of focus uh, LGBTQ uh, families. So first I wanna say, um, you know, having worked in the LGBT movement now for just about 20 years um, as a volunteer and then full-time, um, you know, the, there are, NCLR is just one of the absolute superstar groups. They um, do a lot with a little and make a huge difference. And I think my favorite part about NCLR, in addition to the huge difference and the leadership and the smarts, um, and, and deep wisdom is just the, the people are all really good people. And that just speaks so much to, uh, you know, to, to the, to the values that, uh, that NCLR has. So happy to be here. Um, and, uh, I'll do pretty much anything, uh, anything NCLR asked me to do because I believe so strongly in the organization. So first surrogacy. Um, so the, the bill that we ended up passing the child uh, Parent Security Act was a super comprehensive bill that modernized all family law in New York. And um, the big challenge in New York was around the issue of, of gestational surrogacy or surrogacy in general. Um, New York, some of you um, um, historians uh, or uh, legal folks um, or people who just remember uh, this from the 1990s and late 1980s, New York um, was a uh, um, you know, it, the baby M case happened in the state of New Jersey next door to New York, um, where a um, biological mother um, was carrying someone else's kid, but it was it was her uh, her egg, um, and uh, it turned into a big court uh, battle. Um, the uh, there was a legal agreement that was uh, that the court said was not um, valid, and that the biological mom uh, was able to keep the child that, um, which makes sense, I think, to most everybody, um, that uh, today at least. Um, but what came out of that was a blanket ban on gestational surrogacy, on surrogacy in general in, uh, in New York State and, and in uh, New Jersey until a couple of years ago. Um, and it was really, really hard um, um, to to overturn the law. It was something that was deeply baked in. We had, um, when I took on the issue, you know, I, as, as um, Kathy and Shannon said, I've worked, I worked on marriage really since 2001. There's the, the, uh, the intensity of, of belief about this issue and just the ideological sort of mishmash on this issue was really challenging. I mean, we certainly had the anti-choice folks who oppose any of this stuff. Um, but then we had um, some older feminists who, you know, and I consider myself, I guess I consider myself now an older feminist um, now that I'm, uh, um, I've reached a certain age, but, you know, Gloria Steinem and others who fought hard on the baby in issue just believe that there's no ethical way to do surrogacy, gestational surrogacy. And so it was, it was tough. I mean, um, and, and you had um, both uh, gay men um, and uh, lots of um, women, um, both straight and LGBT, who um, who have had uh, you know issues being pregnant themselves, people who have had cancer, who couldn't have their own kids, um, who in order to build a family um, uh, that's biologically connected to themselves, need to work with a surrogate. And so um, the challenge was so you had very strong views on 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 multiple sides. Um, and a lot of, um, from my perspective, a lot of just uh, old information about, um, you know, about, about surrogacy. And so thankfully, um, Kathy and uh, NCLR um, helped us just immeasurably. Uh, when I, I remember when I first got involved in the issue in New York, and I was talking to, you know, lawyers and um, surrogacy agencies and, um, and, you know, some of the leaders in the reproductive rights movements, you know, the one name that kept popping up was Kathy Sakamura. And, you know, I didn't know Kathy back then. And I was like, well, my gosh, I better figure out who this person is and meet her and see if she'll, uh, see if she'd be willing to help. And she was, she really, you know, Kathy really immersed herself in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, in this struggle. And it took two legislative sessions to get the bill done. But what was so great about Kathy was that she could see the issue from so many different perspectives, um, legally and, and personally, like, 
you know, she could see it from the perspective of a same sex male couple that wanted to have kids. Um, she could see it from the perspective of a, of a woman who, um, you know, who may have less, less power and is, you know, and, and, and who, who, who may want to be a surrogate, but who needs protections in the law. Um, and she could see it from the perspective of, of kids and what's in the best interest of kids. And so the reason I loved working with NCLR and with Kathy so much is that, you know, that NCLR and Kathy are such honest brokers, like, you know, pushing, pushing um, sort of advocates uh, to create a bill that ultimate, the bill that ultimately passed and was signed into law was the, um, you know, it was really a model piece of legislation. It, it had the more protections for surrogates, you know, spelled out in what we call a surrogates bill of rights more than any other uh, uh, such legislation in the country. And so um, we feel great about what we did. We, you know, we, you know, the, the, the protections include, um, you know, a, a guarantee of legal protections for um, the, you know, the woman who's becoming a surrogate uh, paid for by the intended parents, um, full health decision making, um, you know, full choosing their own doctor, full, uh, you know, health insurance post birth for um, months um, longer than in any other state. So we created a bill that I think everybody feels is a model piece of legislation. Um, and um, we created it with, uh, you know, with, with Kathy's um, amazing help. So we're grateful. Um, like the uh, Hair Care Club for Men, I not only uh, worked on the issue, but I, and I use the product. Uh, and I can tell you Susanna's middle name is uh, Leah. It's Susanna Leah. And Leah was the woman who carried uh, Susie as uh, her surrogate. And um, she carried both our kids. We have a deeply close uh, lifelong uh, love and friendship with the woman who was our surrogate and um, she's proud to have uh, helped us make our family and we love her and are forever indebted to her so um so thanks to Kathy thanks to NCLR and um, and uh, you know for helping us uh, have uh, have Susie and her brother Joshua who's uh, downstairs running around a little bit Thank you so much, Mark. I, I thank you so much for all that you've done on this bill and the movement and for joining us um, and um, for all that you shared and sort of such kind words. Uh, it was just such an incredible experience to work on this bill and really work across the movements and come up with solutions with you and others that really got at what the need was, which was to really look at this from multiple perspectives and make sure that everyone had access and protections. So thank you so much. I wanted to highlight a few of the things that, that come out of this bill and how it relates to other aspects of what LGBT families need. Obviously, you know, lots of gay dads become parents through surrogacy. Uh, and when surrogacy is completely illegal, it really, limits options and create situations where people enter informal agreements like the one in baby M that Mark's talked about where no one has protections and then ends up tearing families apart. Um, and so when we can create ethical systems that support families the way they're created, it helps everyone in the situation. Also, I think there were a number of aspects of this bill that were so important for different segments of, for different families in our communities. For example, for transgender parents, this bill created gender neutral language that recognized that people of any gender can have any role in the parenting process or the creation of children, and that non-genetic parents can be recognized of children conceived through assisted reproduction, and many transgender parents do conceive children through, through assisted reproduction as well, um, and making sure that they have access to that same family, uh, same ability to, to have children through assisted reproduction. There's a lot of other issues that transgender parents face. There's still, as Shannon mentioned, 
transgender people still do lose custody of their children through discrimination in courts and in other systems and in the child welfare system as well. And so we have to keep talking about and raising the issues that of that transgender people face and educating people and fighting for people in the courtroom and beyond because there are many more aspects of how transgender families or transgender people with families continue to face discrimination beyond what could be covered by this particular bill. Another important issue is what low-income families face generally. And a couple of aspects of this bill I think were so important for low-income families. First, low-income families who have children through assisted reproduction most commonly do so through known donors at home insemination through ask, through ways of, of achieving pregnancy that don't have a lot of cost associated with them. But many states assisted reproduction bills or laws don't talk about these less invasive, less medically invasive processes of becoming pregnant and don't cover those families. And so importantly, the New York law really broadly covers all of the ways that people access assisted reproduction uh, and provide equal protection for families. Uh, and then finally, the piece of allowing parents to access a free, easily accessible process at every hospital to sign a paper that protects your rights as a parent is so key to creating truly accessible protections for low-income families. And this is an issue we've been really fortunate to work on in a number of states um, and to have New York become one of 10 states that now allows families to do this when they've used assisted reproduction, regardless of parent, the parent's gender. And that is such a key piece uh, to really make these protections a reality. And the last uh, kind of area I wanna highlight is the issues that children with more than two parents face. This is an issue I think that is still an open question in New York and many other states about how do these families get recognized and how do children who have parental relationships with more than two people get protected. And we've been able to make some progress in a number of states. Um, earlier this year, we uh, worked with advocates in Nevada to pass a bill to allow families with more than two parents to protect their families through adoption. Um, and they're working on further legislation to provide more comprehensive protections to families as well. I want to introduce Ming to talk to us about a few stories. Ming Wong is our incredible uh, attorney who runs our helpline and has run our helpline for over 13 years and has spoken to an uncountable number of families about the issues they've faced and how they have faced them and how they've had children and has, I think, just such an incredible insight into what the families in our communities really truly face. Thanks, Kathy. And um, yeah, I'm just very happy and honored to be on this panel and to, you know, to get to work with Shannon and Kathy every day. I mean, they are like the leading lights in this movement. Um, and it's such a privilege to just get to be their colleague. And Mark, it's, so, it's such a privilege to be on this call with you and on the first ever webinar for your daughter. So I assume, I guess maybe she could be a seasoned webinar presenter, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, so I, I work on our helpline, as Kathy said, and um, I will say one thing about our helpline is that over half the people who call us, and we get thousands of calls a year, and over half the people um, who call are low income or rely on public benefits. And um, there's a real need in this country, especially around issues of family law for affordable legal services for low income people. Um, it's a gap that you know, legal services organizations are doing their best to fill, but they are themselves, you know, under-resourced, overcommitted, um, and stretched thin. Um, and it's something this country continues to struggle to provide for low-income families is reliable, competent, culturally competent um, family law legal services. So, um, almost to a person, all the low-income people who've ever called us have expressed that they've had so much difficulty finding an attorney. Many of them have been searching for months 
to find somebody that they can afford or they find somebody and then that attorney just doesn't know anything about LGBTQ people or our lives or how we form families, you know, people feel judged by their own attorneys sometimes. So some in certain kinds of cases, you get a court appointed attorney in dependency cases, but you know, it's a real hit or miss with a court appointed attorney. You could get someone who's knowledgeable or at least willing to learn, or you could get somebody who's like, I don't know the first thing about LGBTQ people and I don't really care and I'm judging your family. So, you know, we get those calls as well. And those are, you know, heartbreaking to hear that the person who's supposed to be advocating for you is instead kind of judging, judging you and, and not really doing their best for you. Um, and, you know, I think as Shannon and Kathy mentioned, low income LGBTQ people are especially likely to be targeted by the child welfare system to be pulled into that system. Um, and then, in, in those systems, you know, those systems are run by people, fallible people who themselves have biases. And um, I'll share one story about a transgender parent. I'm, I'm gonna leave out a lot of identifying information to protect their identity, but let's call him Max. Um, and he was in a state on the East Coast. Um, his wife got pregnant um, through intercourse outside of their relationship. But you know, they decided to stay together after that. They wanted to raise their child together. Max supported the family through the pregnancy. And you know, they had their child. And a year after their child was born, child welfare got involved in their family because um, Max's wife um, had some struggles with her mental health and child welfare just sort of got involved. Even though Max was in the home and there was no question that he was a fine parent to their child because he was not biologically related to their child, um, child welfare started an action to disestablish his parentage. He was on the child's birth certificate because in the hospital, you know, he just said he was the child's father and they put him on the birth certificate. But once child welfare found out that he wasn't biologically related to the child, not only did they bring this action, but they, but they, um, really gratuitously repeatedly brought up the fact that he was a transgender man in this action, which they didn't need to do. They could have just said he's not biologically related to this child. He's in a similar situation to a cisgender man who's not biologically related to the child, but they kept bringing up the fact that he was transgender in a sort of transparent attempt to play on the judge's biases against transgender people. Um, so, you know, they contacted us. We were fortunately able to talk to their court appointed attorney who was luckily um, actually a strong advocate for them, really wanted to do their best, just needed some help from an organization like NCLR to provide some technical assistance and expertise. Um, and we were able to help them kind of proceed with their case, it's ongoing. But, um, but that's just a very kind of, exemplary, is that the word, you know, um, case of, of, there's just so many things happening in the lives of LGBTQ parents, especially LGBTQ low income parents. And, you know, policies like this new law in New York could have helped Max, you know, if, for example, the state could have recognized that this child could have had more than two parents, like it, even if this, even if the welfare agency really wanted to drag this biological father into the picture, who had nothing to do with the child the entire you know for the child's entire life they wanted to drag him into the picture you know they could have kept max on he was an unquestioned fit parent um, to this child and could have been a source of stability in this child's life um, so um just wanted to share that sorry the helpline is like 99 problems you know like that i feel like that's the theme song for our helpline um, <laughs> Um, I don't know if I have time to share one more story about, yeah, so now I want to share one other thing. And these all just came in, in the last year, I'll just say. So these are pretty current. You know, none of this is happening in the distant past. Um, so, you know, we heard from another woman, um, let's call her Lisa, who lived in a state in the South this time. Um, she and her partner, adopted their child, you know, over 10 years ago at a time when, when they couldn't get legally married. 
and they were actually not out because they were they lived in a rural community and were really worried about being out as a couple. So only one of them, Lisa's wife, uh, well, Lisa's partner, so they referred to each other as spouses, but they weren't legally married. So, um, you know, only her partner or wife um, adopted their child. And unfortunately, when they split up, initially they were kind of co-parenting relatively amicably, but something happened and Lisa's partner decided that she no longer um, wanted her to be a parent to their child. Lisa suspected it had something to do with, you know, her trying to get on public benefits um, and not, you know, not wanting to list Lisa as a parent. Um, and so, uh, you know, she was faced with this horrible situation where she was facing being cut off from this child who she had been a parent for, for this child's entire life, you know, over 10 years. This was a teenage child by that time. She had really been the primary parent to this child. The child wanted to live with her. The child had been mostly living with her even after the separation and suddenly was faced with, you know, switching homes, a complete disruption to their life. Um, and of course, the trauma of being separated from a parent. Um, and so, you know, without laws that recognize how people, how people's families actually function, and that respect how people's families actually function without an over-reliance on formal, uh, you know, formal markers of family status, um, you know, people are faced with these sort of horrible crises and traumatic situations. And these, you know, these, these kinds of separations are deeply traumatic for young people. And um, I think something that as a society we need to address and something that I, the thing I love about NCLR is how much we do put young people at the center of our family law policy um, thinking. So I think a big part of that is due to Kathy and Shannon who, you know, are just strong youth advocates in so many ways. So I sort of see our family law work as almost very, very much tied to our youth work. So, yeah. And I think I'm handing this back to Kathy or to Shannon to talk about <laughs> connecting this to our broader movement. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ming. And, you know, I think Ming has just been such an incredible unsung voice in this um, movement because he's not out there in the press or speaking about things as much, but he is he is talking to our community and helping them through some of the darkest times um, that they're experiencing in such an incredibly kind and caring way. And I think just we're so lucky to have Ming be part of this movement and to be working with families and, and everybody who calls us. But yes, I want to bring it back to Shannon to close us out and just talk a little bit about what's coming next for this movement for justice and equality for families um, and, and to tie it a little to what's coming up in, in the future. Oh, gosh, well, I'll say a little bit about that, but I hope every, anyone else should, should definitely chime in. Um, well, I just want to say uh, again about that New York law. The New York law is amazing. I mean, New York from, went from being like one of the worst states in the country. I mean, you, I mean, it used, it used to just shock me. I'd be like New York, which people think of as like, you know, a very blue state and one that's relatively LGBTQ friendly. You couldn't even use a known sperm donor, like, you know, in, in, in without that person being the legal father of your child up until quite recently. Um, it's just extraordinary. And uh, so uh, yay for New York for having like this um, incredible just model law, like you said, Mark. I mean, it is like, it, it's like soup to nuts. Like not only does it deal with like the most sort of, you know, complicated, sophisticated issues relating to assisted reproduction, but like you said, Kathy, and what you just said just rang so true to me. It addresses the actual way people form families and it doesn't, you know, um, get hung up on these formalistic markers or going through a certain legal process or what that or, or things like that. It's really looking how do people actually form family bonds and how can we protect them? So uh, I'm saying all this because that's what we need to do in every state. You know, I mean, it's good to have that model in New York, but we need to replicate that 
in all 50 states. And particularly, there's such a huge need still to protect, you know, non-biological uh, parents who form families in more um, informal ways. Uh, but that's like so many people. That's like a huge, it's not like some little small group in our community. It's like probably even most people in our community. And, um, you know, most most LGBTQ people are low income, you know, so in this is the folks who are most likely, I guess, to not be using expensive legal processes to form their family. So, you know, that is something that as a movement, we really need to, we've done so well on so many things with, you know, marriage equality, adoption rights, uh, and, and, and sort of formal family relationships. And now we really need to, to tackle the overwhelming need for more legal protections and just a more sane, sensible uh, family law structure for uh, for the the rest of our community, which is probably most of our community. Again, so that's one thing. You know, that's going to involve uh, and does involve a lot of uh, cross movement work. So that is our future, folks. We've got to like really be intersectional. We have to be collaborative, and we have to work across movements, including. Yeah, you know, like Kathy, you're such a leader in that regard with the Family Protection Project, which I think was, I think the first LGBT project or in the in the country to partner formally in that way with legal aid organizations and try to help build up competence to represent uh, low income LGBTQ parents. So yeah, you know, that's the future. But Kathy Ming or Mark, I would love to hear any anything you all have to say about about what's in front of us right now too. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And I think really thinking about how cross movement work is so important and how, you know, what the issues that affect LGBTQ families also affect lots of other families too, and lots of other people. And when we really work with people who are focused on all the different ways that people experience discrimination and have needs as families, you know, groups focused on incarcerated parents and groups that are focused on reproductive health and women's rights and, and racial justice. And, and when we all work together, we can come up with solutions that truly serve the needs that all families face. And when we do that, we all benefit because no one really thrives in a system that only recognizes a singular rigid way to be a family or to, to, to exist in the world. Um, and so I think that work has been so key to getting to where we are and um, will be even more important in, in today's world and moving forward. Yeah, I totally agree. Sorry, Susie, I startled her. Um, I totally agree because uh, one of the communities that just in a very tangible way that we really worked in close partnership with on the Child Parent Security Act in New York was the uh, the community of women who, um, you know, have had really tough experiences with infertility. And, and um, it's, you know, and, and a lot of them as we went around, um, uh, you know, in, in Albany to meet with state lawmakers, it was really almost a, or not almost, it was a coming out process for a lot of these folks to share just the pain and agony. I mean, sometimes physical, always um, emotional about um, their experience with, um, with infertility, the expectations to have a kid and not being able to. And so it was really, I mean, one of my favorite parts of working on this was um, getting to work with, uh, some incredible um, women of all stripes uh, who um, who also were passionate about the cause. And I think you're right. It's like there are certain folks for whom it's you know very easy to have a family uh, for lots of different reasons, and then there are um, there are others uh, that that need some help. And thankfully, we have the science now, and it's a matter of the laws, um, the laws and the ethics uh, catching up with where we are. I would just echo all that. And I think, yeah, Shannon, you know, I, I know the word intersectionality sometimes seems buzzy, but, but our lives are just intersectional. Nobody is just gay or just trans. You know, our lives actually happen at these intersections. So it makes sense that our activism and our work should happen at those intersections too. 
Wonderful. And I was going to open it up to questions and I see that we, we have a question already in the chat and, or at least someone reaching out. And I think it's such an important topic. It, um, I don't know if everybody can see this, Elizabeth. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, that um, someone reached out to us to, to ask about increasing access to infertility services and coverage for fertility care um, so that people can actually access reproductive, um, uh, access assisted reproduction services and have it be covered through insurance. And that's such an important issue, of course, because a big reason why there's a difference in um, income and how people access assisted reproduction is because of the cost and because it is often not covered by insurance. And this is also another area that we have been working on across movements to come up with ways that really looked at how lack of coverage for fertility services impacts many different people in our community. So being able to access and pay for assisted reproduction services and surrogacy costs, as well as fertility preservation for transgender people and anybody who has a health condition that, that may impact their fertility. Um, that it's very, very expensive um, to to preserve fertility for many people and to be able to, you know, to retrieve eggs and to freeze embryos and to store them is extremely expensive and typically not covered um, by most plans. And so states really are starting to look at that more to, to provide some coverage, but many, if not really most or all of the states still do so in ways that are discriminatory against LGBT people by requiring a condition, a diagnosed condition of infertility or having had intercourse without having a successful pregnancy in order to access a benefit obviously excludes many, many LGBT people from that coverage and protection. And there are some great organizations in a number of movements focused on these issues that we've been able to collaborate with and continue to, to work on trying to move this issue forward. So I'd love to be in touch with anyone who's doing that work in your area. Kathy, I know we may be out of questions and comments and that's great and we can wrap up. I just wanna say one last thing because I, I'm just guessing that there may be people listening or I know, or all of us probably know in our lives, uh, someone who's had to fight for their right to be a parent to their own child or maybe was not protected by the law, fought and lost, or was not even able to even have any kind of legal action to protect yourself or try to protect your child. And I just say, one of the things that makes me the proudest to be part of this community is all the people I've seen just being so committed to their children under such adverse circumstances. And it's, it's uh, if anybody has gone through that, I just want to just give you a shout out and say, I'm just, it's the, it's the hardest thing in the world to go through. It's one of the hardest things in the world to go through. And um, I look forward to the day when no, no parent in our community has to deal with that anymore. Oh gosh, someone's asking about that new documentary, Nuclear Family. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Kathy or Ming or Mark, have you seen it? No, honestly, I'm so sorry. I don't have great access to TV and I also have young children. So <laughs> getting time to watch TV. Although of course we, you know, we're familiar with the story and the family and um, everything that happened other than the documentary, but I, we didn't talk about that yet. Um, I see there's um, another question also about, um, Shannon, for you, are we any concerns about losing grounds um, or losing gains in terms of family law because of the new Supreme Court? I don't think so. Um, I know there's lots of uh, um, commentary out there right now and, and, we're, and very real worries, which I share that the court may uh, either undermine severely or even reverse. Roe v. Wade, that's deadly serious and very real. And I know there is some people are worried that if they would do that with Roe, might they not, you know, potentially reverse Obergefell or something like that. I, I do not think that they will. I, I really don't. Um, 
but I, you know, they may chip away at Obergefell by creating new religious exemptions, but that's, that's something we've known for some time now. I mean, we're seeing this court create new religious exemptions and that is troubling and worrisome, but uh, not, not in the way that like a serious threat to uh, reversing Oberg of reversing Obergefell would be. And I, I just really do not see that coming. If I did, I would say so and try to rally the troops and get us to, you know, prepare for that. But I really, really don't think it's going to, to, to happen. However, I think the reason it's highly unlikely to happen is because we have such strong public opinion on our side and we should not take that for granted. So I definitely want to say that too. We're protected as long as we have public opinion with us, which is why it's important to continue to, for everybody to stay politically engaged, for us to continue to tell our stories. We should not take it for granted. We should not take for granted the social progress that we have made. It's, it's a treasure that we work for so hard and we should continue to work hard to keep it. Thank you so much, Shannon. And I see there's a, a follow-up comment on the nuclear family documentary. And I just wanted to say that I think it the the story of what happened and, and just the fact that that I, a documentary was made does show that the ways that we form families can be can raise complex and conflicting issues. And they are about personal relationships and really just can, can, all, can cause all kinds of questions under the law, but also in our personal lives. And that the impact on the children of what has happened through this time of so much legal uncertainty for our families has been great and continues into our children's adulthood. That these things that happen when we have family conflicts and not great protections and recognition for families that creates a lot of fear about breakups and or disagreements about who is gonna be a parent also can cause personal relationship breakdowns that can um, have a lasting imprint on children's lives as well. I don't uh, see any more open questions, I think. see Shannon is making connections. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I know that we would love to hear from any of you individually um, and talk to you about um, any of the issues that are important to you. Oh. Willie's, Willie, hey Willie. Willie's asking about uh, third parent cases. Kathy, you're the expert on that. Yeah, I mean, that certainly is, you know, such an important issue because I think until recently it was something that was difficult even to talk about um, and not, you know, be attacked for talking about how to create those legal protections and really the first um, law, comprehensive and explicit law addressing um, multiple parent families we were able to pass in California. And that was really a difficult bill to pass. Um, but we've been able now to have a number of states start recognizing um, that children can have more than two parents. Um, and, you know, I think the challenges are, you know, lots of concerns about what will happen in terms of custody and visitation if you have more than two people. Um, and I think really courts have seen that for the most part, they can see obviously how families have shared um, parenting time and continue to reflect that in shared agreements and custody um, arrangements. Certainly challenges exist for families because of this continuing fear and stigma about polyamory, whether or not multiple parent families are polyamorous families, often they are either um, co-parents or, um, you know, friends who have co-parented or, you know, successive partners who've remained involved as parents. And so there are so many ways that people can have, the children can have more than two parents, of course. Um, and certainly in the courts, it can be really challenging to explain 
why the law can recognize more than two parents if it's not explicitly allowed, um, because the law really does in many ways have a bias toward recognizing two parents because it essentially is based in a marital system, which is what really a lot of our family law grew out of and everything that goes beyond um, married parents being recognized as the parents of their children are, are things that we have added on in the modern family law. So I think it, it is a real challenge um, to have families be recognized. So my co-panelist is really wanting me to wrap up. So I'm going to uh, yes. leave you here, <laughs> but thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And um, onward and upward. Lots Absolutely. More to, lots more to win, lots more to do. So Thank, Thank you so Mark. much, Mark. Hi, Susie. <laughs> yes, and Shannon recommends Willie's book. I absolutely do as well. And thank you for participating, Willie. Can I jump in with another story, Kathy, about three parent situations? I think it's so true. Like people assume that these laws are just for polyamorous families, but I think probably most situations where there might be three or more parents aren't don't involve um you know Paul, just thinking about how straight people have families you know they may not even involve lgbtq people at all um i recently spoke with somebody who's in a situation where you know the two women were together one of them um sorry <laughs> that's my doorbell you know one of them um had an affair and um, had a child um, with somebody they had the affair with, the two women decided to raise the child together, but also wanted the child to know who their biological, their other biological parent was. That person kind of came in and then, you know, they, the three of them kind of parented together until of course there was a disagreement. And then now there's this difficult question of if the court can only find two of them to be parents, which two? Um, and in some ways, it would be much more just if the court could at least consider that all three of them were parents. And you could completely see this happening with a straight couple as well. It wouldn't have to be a same-sex female couple that this involved, so. Absolutely. And then, of course, there are polyamorous families who deserve the same protections and should also have this recognition. But I think it's very limiting to say that's the only kind of family that we're talking about, because as all of this has shown, there's so, so many ways that families can be formed and so many ways they can look. Um, and, and, and we have to come up with systems that really do truly look at what children's real experiences are and who they view, view as their families and, and who we really view as our family needs to be recognized under the law. Wonderful. Well, if there aren't any questions, I think we can wrap up a bit early and give you back a few more minutes to um, have of your evening. And I want to just thank you so much, Shannon and Ming and Mark and Susanna and Imani, who um, aren't able to, to be here anymore to, for being part of this discussion. And I, it has just been my incredible privilege to be able to do this work at NCLR and talk to so many incredible families and advocates in this process. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.